Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, welcome to the 2014 Morris Katz Lecture in Environmental Research. And um, it's my great pleasure, as usual, to be able to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Philip Hopke from uh, Clarkson University in New York. And if you want to know where that is, that's in New York. And surprisingly, to get there, you would go north, probably past Barrie, probably to about Aurelia level, and then turn due east and travel, oh, about four or five hours across the equivalent of the St. Lawrence until you get to uh, Clarkson University. So uh, yeah, quite a ways north of us, but interesting place. Um, before I introduce our speaker, again, the housekeeping duties. Uh, so we've got some snacks laid out for you afterwards, so please stick around afterwards. Come down and meet our speaker and in person. Ask him a few questions. We ask that you hold your questions until the end. But when we when you do ask questions, it's being taped. So um, please use the microphone to ask your questions. There's one there. That one over there will be portable. So I'll hand that around for people who want to stay in their seat. And uh, we'll, we'll have questions in that way. And as per usual, I'd like to thank the organizer of this event, Carol Weldon. Uh, thank you, Keldon, Carol, for organizing this. So we'll just give her a round of applause now so that we don't forget. Um, the Morris Katz Lecture, I'll keep the introduction to that fairly short, but uh, most of you know the history. It was organized by the, um, established by the chemistry department in 1990 in memory of Morris Katz. Um, who was a member of the chemistry department here at York. Um, and the lectureship was made possible by an endowment fund that was set up by the Katz family. And the lecture is also supported by the Center for Atmospheric Chemistry and the Ontario Ministry of the Environment who continues to support the lecture. Um, so thank you to them. Um, Professor Philip Hopke, um, started in, uh, he received his BSc in chemistry from Trinity College in 1965, received his PhD from Princeton University in 1969. Uh, he was uh, a research associate at MIT for a short period of time, uh, and then went to the State University College at Fredonia in New York in, as an assistant professor and spent about four, four years time there. He then went to the University of Illinois and spent a bit of time there. He was at the Institute for Environmental Studies and he became a professor of environmental chemistry with joint appointments in the departments of civil engineering and nuclear engineering. So that's where his research started in uh, nuclear engineering. In 1989, he joined Clarkson University, which is a private university in the States as the first Robert A. Plain professor. And he served as the Dean of Graduate Studies, the chair of the department, head of the Division of Physical and Chemical Sciences. And in 2000, he moved, moved to the Department of Chemical Engineering uh, while retaining his appointments in civil and environmental engineering. Um, in 2002, he became the Bayard D. Clarkson Distinguished Professor and the director of the Center for Air Resources Engineering and Science. And in 2010, having one uh, center was not enough. He also became the founding director of the Institute for a Sustainable Environment. Um, he's received many awards. He gets around quite a bit around the world. He'll tell you about some of the work that he's doing in other places and in North America. Um, I decided when we were uh, inviting him to come here that I would print out his CV, um, which was online. So I found it and started to print it out. My, he has his publication list in there. My printer ran out of paper, so I put some more paper in. My printer ran out of paper again. So I put some more paper in, and then it ran out of ink. And I kind of gave up after that. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> a long story short, uh, um, Professor Hopke has more than 500 peer-reviewed publications at the current time, about 85 chapters in books in peer-reviewed proceedings. Um, he's written one book and edited five books, and he's directed a total of about uh, close to 90 MSc and PhD students throughout his career. 
He's been a tad busy for a while. Um, so his research interests are in multivariate statistical methods for data analysis, chemical characterization of ambient aerosols, uh, emissions and properties of solid biomass combustion systems. We might hear a little bit about that today. Um, characterization of source receptor relationships for ambient air pollutants, uh, experimental studies of, of homogeneous, heterogeneous, and ion-induced nucleation, indoor air quality and exposure and risk assessment. And the title of his presentation today is 40 plus years of development and application of receptor modeling. Where are we now? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And we'll move on. So, no, actually, I hadn't planned on speaking much about solid fuel bus combustion today. We're talking mostly about how to play with data. Okay, and again, want to thank everybody for inviting me. It's been a great experience. Carol's a wonderful organizer, so things have gone very smoothly. And it's a great pleasure to have a chance to come back to York. I visited here somewhere 20 some odd years ago, uh, back when I was regularly interacting with the Ministry of the Environment. And so what I want to do is look a little bit about what receptor modeling is all about, and then run you through some history, and then look at, at the sorts of kinds of things you can do with the, some of the techniques that have been developed uh, over the last 35, 40 years. Again, one of the problems is that we've come a long way in improving air quality. Um, so, but there are still a lot of places that have far to go. And even in our case, we're concerned that we, as we lower the con concentration levels, we're still seeing significant health effects. So in terms of, of even in North America, we still have issues that we want to deal with. But particularly in a lot of developing and relatively developed countries, there's still significant problems. I am a World Bank consultant to the government of Bangladesh, where we are trying to build an air quality management system under relatively difficult conditions. So, and have a number of collaborations throughout sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia. And so applying these techniques helps in a number of ways to provide the data that allows for effective and efficient control strategies focusing on the sources that are most important in producing the problem. Now, a lot of people use chemical transport models for strategy development because they give you a lot of what if kinds of capabilities, but sometimes it's also helpful to understand what's actually there because in many cases in the past, particularly we've seen incidences where things pop up that nobody really understood were there. So what are we trying to do here? What we're trying to do here is actually get the relationship between the emissions and the measured concentrations. And so we have things like chemical transport or dispersion models, which start here and try and apply meteorology and chemistry and get here. What we're going to try and do is start here and infer back to there. So we have emissions and gases and particles. The gases can undergo a variety of oxidative processes in the atmosphere. In some cases, they'll stay as gas phase species. In some cases, they'll form new particles, and in other cases, they'll condense onto the surface of existing particles. At the same time, particles get emitted. Depending on the relative temperatures and the nature of the particles, those, some of those particles could evaporate. They certainly will dry and wet deposit and do so differentially depending on the size and composition. Again, changing the nature of what was here to what's there and some will stay as airborne particles. So we have this combination of primary and secondary material that's out in the atmosphere, 
that we will then pull through typically some size fractionating inlet to collect onto a filter, which we will then take back to the laboratory and measure with great diligence what we found there. But we have a variety of potential problems associated with that. We can have gas phase semi-volatiles adsorb onto the filters. We can have materials that are collected on the filters, such as ammonium nitrate, since many sampling systems start at midnight, nice and cool, relatively high humidity. We put the ammonium nitrate on the, onto the filters, get to the middle of the afternoon where it's hot and dry, and that material will then vaporize back off. So again, there are potentials for both positive and negative artifacts. And in all this complicated stuff, we wind up con concentrations for which we want to then infer who put the particles in the air. Okay, so in this case, we do want to point fingers. All right, now, fundamental principle of receptor modeling is a mass balance. And a lot of this comes from Sheldon Friedlander, Sheldon being a good chemical engineer, the first thing you think about is a chemical balance, mass balance. And so what we want to do then is to assume that if we have this parcel of air, the amount of any given substance in there is the sum of the independent contributions of a variety of sources that, or source types that contribute to it. So we can think about a simple mass balance equation in which we are going to then take the concentration of some given species in a given sample. So we're looking at the jth chemical constituent in the ith sample. We're going to have p independent sources, and we're then going to have a composition of material from the kth source of a particular species j in nanograms of whatever, per nanogram of particulate matter, and then we're going to have a mass contribution in nanograms per cubic meter of that kth source contributing to the ice sample. So this is our hypothetical model. You'll note that I haven't put things like residuals on because this is our hypothetical model. We haven't tried to fit it yet. So how do we invent then apply this? Well, depends on what we know to start with. If we know something about the sources, that's a different problem than if I don't know anything about the sources. If I know something about the sources, then I can fit this in a different way. And the primary way that this was done in the past has been called the chemical mass balance. We'll talk about that in a little more detail. One can also apply some chemometrics methods multivariate calibration methods, and people have done partial least squares and various artificial neural networks, simulated annealing, genetic algorithms. None of that has caught on, and so I'm not gonna say anything more about it. These thing, techniques are out there. It's not clear they're any significantly better than um, the linear regression approach in the chemical mass balance. So the chemical mass balance equation we can rewrite, and you'll note what I've done here is I've dropped the I, because now what I'm doing is I'm going to fit this on a sample by sample basis. So what I'm now doing is relating, again, a matrix of source profiles covering the P independent sources and the jth uh, species, but now I just have a vector of mass contributions and since we're fitting this, and we're going to fit this with some degree of uncertainty, since we have measurements with uncertainty, we wind up then with a residual that we're going to want to minimize as part of the fitting process. And the first real paper on this was actually published by Jack Winchester and his student Gordon Nifong uh, when they were looking at dry deposition going into Lake Michigan. Now, most people actually pay more attention to uh, Miller, uh, Heidi, and Friedlander, but that actually was a year later. 
So again, they found that the major sources of air pollution contributing trace elements to the atmosphere over southern Lake Michigan were things like coal burning, coke oven emissions, burning of fuel oil, automobile fuel, remembering that back in those good old days we had lead and bromine as nice tracers. Really stupid, but nice tracers. <laughs> and emissions from iron and steel manufacturing plants and emissions from cement manufacturing. So they were able to, to get six different source types and got probable compositions from the available literature. So they basically were using specific elements as tracers for each of the sources. Similar work was performed by Miller, George Heide, and Shell Friedlander, published the next year. And then Shell, in an important paper in 73, introduced the idea of a real multiple regression analysis based on multiple species for each source type. But again, it was a relatively limited number of species, and he termed that the chemical element balance. So a number of studies followed, as well as some initial studies to start doing source sampling. Uh, there were two big studies going on. One was a research applied to national needs, NSF-sponsored program at the University of Maryland, headed up by Glenn Gordon and Bill Zoller. And then there was the Portland Air Quality Study uh, that involved John Watson, John Cooper, number of other people who uh, are still uh, in the business. So Portland was out of attainment with the air quality standard for TSP, so they couldn't permit any additional sources. So they set up a coordinated ambient, source and ambient and source sampling program between 76 and 80 to get better profiles. John, as part of his PhD work, developed an improved approach to doing the least squares regression, which we'll talk about in a minute. And what was happened is that they were able to find a number of problems that then fed into the chemical transport model that they were trying to use. They found, for example, one stack was in the wrong vertical grid. They found a roadway was in one, incorrectly in one horizontal grid. They found a couple of other things, and when they cleaned those up, they were able to get the model to much better reflect the data, and the model then could be used more effectively to identify problems and provide the way forward in terms of a strategy. So in 79, John Watson, as part of his thesis, and Al Dunker, who was working at the GM research labs, independently recognized that the use of ordinary regression analysis was incorrect. Because as you all remember from your fun-filled undergraduate statistics course, that we always assume that the independent variable is without error. Well, that's clearly not true. We went and took a sample and we made measurements. And we all know that those things have uncertainties in them. And so if we're going to do this right, we have to be able to propagate in the uncertainties in the source profile. And there's a whole branch of statistical analysis on error models that have a variety of ways of solving that. And John and Alan went and looked at it. Again, if we think about the normal least squares fitting approach, what we're doing in a weighted least squares is looking at the difference between the measurement and the model weighted by some measure of the uncertainty in the measurement. Well, that's fine. That at least gets us out of the problem of scale because again, if we're looking at trace elements in the atmosphere, we have things that range from major elements, aluminum and silicon, down to minor and trace elements like europium and lanthanum. And so if we're going to have a linear fit, we have to be able to get them all onto the same scale, and this does that. So the idea of a weighted least squares comes in from Glenn Gordon's group 
But now what we really need to do is to include the uncertainties in the source profiles. And we can do that by adding this additional term in which we then have the uncertainty in the source profile times the source contribution, the estimated source contribution, as an additional term in the weight. But then you sit there and say, wait a minute, I thought this is what we're trying to get out of the analysis. And the answer is yes, indeed. So we cannot do this in closed form. We have to do it in a stepwise iterative fashion. We start out with the ordinary weighted least squares solution. That gives us a set of G values. We can then plug them in, run another round, see where we are, and keep going until the system converges to some sort of convergence criteria. And at that point, we have presumably a better estimate of the source contributions. So this system then was first defined in an 84 paper by Cooper, Watson, and Jim Hunsinger, and was codified in CMB software. The first was available in 88 and has evolved now into CMB 8.2 that you can download from the US EPA website. It's been widely used for particularly PM10 apportionment because it really works very nicely for primary particles where you have good uh, sets of, of species that define it. It's also been used extensively for looking at organic species or trying to apportion some of the organic carbon through the work of Glenn Cass and his students. So the key issue in the application of CMB is I've got to know the source profiles. And it's difficult and expensive to perform emission sampling. We did a fair amount of emission sampling in the 70s up through the 80s, but if you look at the speciate database that's available from EPA, there's not a lot of point sources that have been measured since 1993. And one suspects that there aren't too many of those point sources that are still behaving in the same way as they did in 1993. So yes, there are source profiles out there, but whether they're applicable to any problem these days is unclear. We've done a lot of source testing on mobile vehicles. We've probably got four to 5,000 individual cars that have been looked at, probably four to 500 heavy duty diesel trucks. But we have a fleet of more than 150 million cars and several hundred thousand heavy duty diesel trucks. So how representative is that relatively small sample of the fleet average? So that's part of our problem. How do we really get at what these source profiles are? And one of the particular problems is that you have people in other places around the world who have then easy access to this EPA software and the EPA speciate database who then go and take 1985 profiles for various sources, apply it to their data, and then want to get published. And I get most of those papers to review. Okay, now, one of the things that's you know, an interesting way to look at this is some work done as part of the Pittsburgh Supersite exercise. Um, one of uh, Alan Robinson's students. And what they do is they like to look at ratio-ratio plots to compare ambient data to source profiles. So they're looking at various ratios of stearanes and hopanes. And what I want to point out here is that in each of these cases, you have a cluster of ambient data. And then you have the individual points source measurements that have been made by various people. And you'll see that there's very little overlap between the measured source profiles of individual vehicles and where most of the cars and trucks in the fleet are. So again, we have this issue of 
you know, reasonable numbers of cars and trucks that have been measured, but how do we aggregate those individual profiles into a fleet average profile that's actually out there? And so what they've done then is to utilize these data to estimate new profiles, which they could then put in here. But you can see there's a wide scatter of different motor vehicle profiles compared to the relatively well-organized ambient data. Having large numbers of vehicles averages over a multitude of sins. And the fact that the source profiles exhibit much more variability than the ambient data is probably not really surprising. Okay, so each source profile represents emissions from a single or small number of vehicles while the ambient data is lots of vehicles. So they then developed fleet average profiles and proceeded to perform the CMBs, examining a variety of scenarios to explore the range of uncertainties. And so again, looking at these kinds of things and so what we're going to do then is look at a time series of CMB solutions for winter, total vehicular OC, total vehicular OC is a fraction of the total VOC, gasoline OC, diesel OC, and a ratio of gasoline to diesel. And you can see that the solid lines are done on the basis of some specific ones, and then there's their fleet average. You can see that for some things there's reasonable coherence, but for other things there can be a pretty wide variability depending on whether you're using specific source profiles like Jamie Showers or the Northern Front Range Air Quality Study profiles, or whether you're using these fleet average profiles derived from the data and that you're much better off probably working from your own ambient data. So in general, the up-to-date and locally relevant profiles for CMB are generally not available. And it's generally not easy to get. I mean, obviously no company wants you coming into their property, shinning up their smokestack and sticking a probe in it to see what they're really putting out. It's also great fun trying to convince the graduate students that that's good for their uh, PhD theses. So, I mean, the only, one, only profiles we've ever measured were back when I was at Illinois, when we did it in conjunction with the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency who could get us onto the site because the site owners had no choice. So, there are value in CMB, but it, it, it has some real problems if you cannot get up-to-date, locally applicable profiles. So I've spent most of my career working on where I don't know what the profiles are to start with. And that then means that we're looking at various forms of factor analysis, principal components analysis, uh, and we were some of the early people in that back in the mid-70s, absolute principal components analysis, talk about in a minute, uh, that developed by George Thurston as part of his PhD work with Jack Spengler. Uh, safer unmix, which is Ron Henry, moving to unmix as his current model. And then what we'll spend most of our time talking about is positive matrix factorization. Factor analysis, or actually principal components analysis, was actually some of the first of the receptor model papers published. You can see this goes back to volume one of atmospheric environment um, by Blifford and Meeker, where they took a data from a national monitoring network in the United States where they had high volume samplers collected it and did uh, in basically um, spark emission uh, optical spectroscopy to get at the elemental concentrations. So the Public Health Service had this national air sampling network. Remember the EPA is informed till 1970. And so 
what they did was collect this data, produced factor analyses for each of 30 cities, and the first four principal factors they tentatively assigned to heavy industries, automobile, fuel burning, petroleum refining, and that that can counted for about 70% of the variance. However, in every case, they found another 20% of the variance associated to the, what they attributed to the widespread use of plating materials, which mostly involve copper. Well, this is an issue because, in fact, what they were really looking at was a sampling artifact. As we all now fondly remember, the Electrolux vacuum cleaner motor, remember it has to be Electrolux, that's in the federal regulations, because it was the only thing with enough pressure drop capability to pull air through a glass fiber, eight by 10 inch glass fiber filter, has copper brushes in the motor. And so what's happening is you're pushing these copper brushes against the rotor in order to provide the electricity that spins it. That copper ablates and puts wonderful 30 nanometer particles of copper out into the atmosphere. And if you don't vent them away from your sampler, you have a copper source. So factor analysis was not, there's another paper about the same time by Prince and Strottmann in Staub, Reinhardt, De Luft, but really wasn't used then for a decade until we reintroduced it in 76 and Jarvis Moyers and some of the other people at Arizona reintroduced it about the same time. This is a case of we were able to beat them because we picked the right journal. Review times were much longer for ES and T than they were for AE, so we were able to scoop Jarvis. All right, so PCA methods were replaced then by target transformation factor analysis that could provide a result that looked much more like a CMB. The problem with a typical PCA is that you, in fact, what's called Z-transform your data. You subtract off a mean, you divide by a standard deviation. So what you're really doing is partitioning the data from the mean instead of partitioning the absolute value. And it's the absolute value that we want. And so we started developing this. First paper was published in 1980. It took me four years to get that paper published because all the reviewers knew that that couldn't be done. Um, at the same time, in the mid-80s, George proposed uh, absolute principle components analysis, where he took the centered results and uncentered them and unscaled them. And that works, but it repropagates certain errors so that it's probably not a good idea. At that point, neither were considered seriously by EPA. And in the late 80s, early 90s, it was recognized, again, that the level of effort needed to characterize sources was waning, additional controls were going on to sources, and there were increasing limitations to the applicability of CMB. So in the late 80s, early 90s, then Ron and his student, Bong Wan Kim, developed the safer approach, which ultimately got moved around and became unmix. And then in 93, Penti Pataro, along with a student, Unto Tapper, uh, developed positive matrix factorization. So SAFER, as I say, has evolved into unmix in the 90s with support from EPA. We, Penti and I, collaborated for a number of years to develop PMF, and we had a, a shootout in 2000 based on an artificial grade data set 
created for this mythical town, Palookaville, as well as from some real data from Phoenix. One of the problems on all of these systems is trying to find a way to really validate the data analysis tools. People have tried to develop synthetic data, but it's never really had the complexity that real data has. I mean, you can take source profiles, you can propagate uncertainties into them, but real data is always a lot more complex and no one has yet really found a good way to produce artificial data that has the same level of complexity as, as real data. The most recent effort has been at the European Union Joint Research Center in ISPRA where they used a chemical transport model to try and put together such data. But even there it became relatively limited what you can do. So in this case, 16 different profiles were used, nine point sources, four industrial complexes, one area source, two highways, et cetera, et cetera. Put in uncertainty, and we were still able to pull out uh, most of the uh, sources resolved with the inability to resolve a pair that were set to be highly collinear. And so realistically, there was no way that you could, you could pull them apart. All right, now, the problem with PCA and Unmix and Safer and APCA is that they all use an eigenvector analysis. So what you're doing is trying to compress a data set into a series of vectors which have decreasing amounts of the residual variance that's available to you. And so you're trying to separate the signal from the noise. The problem is that if you really look carefully at what an eigenvector analysis is, is that it is in fact really an unweighted least squares fit. You are in fact actually minimizing the difference between the measurement and the model. And as we had recognized back in the 70s, that's not a good way to go. You really need a weighted least squares fit. Now you can weight by a column or a row with eigenvector analysis, but you cannot weight individual data points. And so the recognition of that was that we really needed a different approach that was explicitly least squares, where we could individually data point weight. And so that's what PMF is. It allows us to put weights on individual data points, allows us then to deal better with things like below detection limit values and missing values so that they can go into the analysis but with very little weight. And so they get fit rather than driving the fit. It's also much easier to apply external constraints like non-negativity or any other known relationships. We know how to do uh, least squares fits to particular endpoints and we can create much more complex models. And I'm not gonna have time today to get into the complex models. So PMF has now become the most widely used receptor model, hundreds of published papers. EPA PMF has been downloaded more than 1,200 times. And so lots of people are into doing them, applying it to particle compositions, particle size distributions, VOC compositions. We've developed advanced models in which we can incorporate meteorological and other data, can combine data at different time intervals of the sampling and analysis, looked at particle size composition as a function of size, recognizing that in that case, a source profile is not a vector, but is in fact a matrix. And 
looked at variables measured at multiple sites. So what I want to do today then as an example is show you some data from St. Louis. This is a particularly nice example because it's one of the few places left in the United States with lots of nice well-defined point sources. And so this work was described a few years back by Jung Hun Lee. And what we have here is daily integrated 20 PM 2.5 mass, two years of data from 2001 to 2003, using a Harvard impactor for mass and elements by XRF, using another Harvard uh, collection system to get ions by ion chromatography, and Jamie Shower's low volume sampler to get OCEC done with the improved TOR protocol. So we're looking at St. Louis, Missouri, downtown. St. Louis is in here, the arch is about there. The super sites across the river in East St. Louis. And as I say, there are four major point sources. There is a steel mill complex up here, what used to be Granite City Steel. There is uh, what was the remaining primary lead smelter in the United States, which closed last year at Herculeum, a zinc plant and a copper plant. So we were able to identify 10 sources from the PMF and other kinds of analyses we'll talk about. Secondary sulfate, secondary nitrate, a carbon-rich sulfate, gasoline and diesel, soil, and then the four major point sources. So let me just illustrate, for example, airborne soil. We get a profile which is high in things like aluminum, silicon, calcium, iron, potassium. There's some organic stuff associated with it. And there's also some sulfate that co-varies with it. And that may well be that, in fact, sulfate has deposited on the surface of the particles. You'll see that what we have are relatively low levels because remember we're looking at PM 2.5. So most of the soil is coarse particles and we don't see a lot of those coming along. But you'll also see that we see some high episodes in the summertime, in July or maybe June. And so the question then is why? And so if we look <clears throat> in more detail and draw air parcel back trajectories, and in fact, if I carry this back trajectory long enough, it'll take me back to the west coast of Africa. Okay, everybody needs to remember how Columbus got to the United States, or got to, got to the Caribbean, rather. Never got to the United States, okay? Remember that he knew enough that he had to sail south to get into the trade winds. Well, those trade winds provide a nice source of Saharan desert dust into the United States, and this was a particularly high episode. You could look at the chemical speciation network data and watch this pass right across the US. All right, so we typically see something with sulfur and ammonia. You know, one of the things you want to look at when you're looking at this is do you get a reasonable ion balance? Remember, we're showing here in terms of mass, but what you've got to really do is convert it into molarity and make sure that you wind up with charge neutrality. That makes the chemical gods happier. You'll note that this tends to peak in the summertime when there's higher photochemical activity and more rapid conversion of the SO2 to sulfate. And then the question is, okay, where does the sulfur come from? Again, we're not getting a lot of primary sulfate being emitted, we're getting a lot of SO2 emitted, and SO2 takes a while to cook into sulfate. So we'd like to be able to get an idea as to where 
that SO2 is coming from, and we can do that by using an ensemble of back trajectories. So we can actually look then at a back trajectory as a series of one-hour endpoints. We can count how many of those endpoints fall into a given grid scale. And that then gives us this number. We can then calculate, we can then look at how many of those endpoints in that grid cell are associated with high concentrations of the pollutant of interest. And that gives us this. High in this case typically means above the mean because mean values in these distributions is typically between the 65th and 70th percentile. And so now we get a conditional probability that that grid cell had something to do with the high concentration. We can make pretty plot plots on a map. And you can see in this case that the sulfate is coming primarily from the Ohio River Valley and down through the Tennessee Valley, which is areas we know has a large number of coal-fired power plants. Uh, and so this goes along quite nicely with what we know. Yes, in fact, it means that we're looking at times when the winds are coming from east to west in an area where we typically have prevailing westerlies, but there certainly are things like Pacific Maritimes which come across and will bring those high episodes in here. If we have a Bermuda high, then we're going to typically have lower sulfate values because they're going to wind up with the high sulfate values up there. Okay, so this makes sense. I can have a similar thing with ammonium nitrate. In this case, it comes in the winter time because what free radicals, or what hydroxyl radicals are out there in the winter are going to react with the NO2 since that reaction rate is 10 times faster than the reaction rate with SO2 and the colder temperatures are going to enhance the partitioning of the ammonia and gas phase nitric acid into particulate ammonium nitrate. Okay, so that's all good. And now if I do the PSCF, I get a little bit over here, but now I'm seeing big blotches of source contributions seemingly coming from northwestern Iowa and central Kansas. And you ask, what's that all about? Well, again, remember that to make ammonia, ammonium nitrate is different than ammonium sulfate. Ammonium nitrate's always in equilibrium with the ammonia and gas phase nitric acid. So I need the ammonia as well as I need the nitric acid. Okay? This is where America's bacon comes from. There are large numbers of CAFOs concentrated animal feeding operations, okay? And you pack thousands of hogs into a relatively small area, you produce a lot of ammonia, okay? Out here, what we're doing is we're putting ammoniacal fertilizer on to make the corn plants happy. And so this really fits rather nicely in terms of ammonia, whereas over here we're seeing things which are probably sources of the nitrate. And if we look then at emissions inventory of ammonia, you can see that we do in fact see this area up here, area down here. Now some of the other areas don't show up, presumably because we're not getting transported at a time when we would have enough gas phase nitric acid to form the ammonium nitrate. All right. So, we see a lead factor, we know there's a lead smelter, but let me draw your attention then to the contribution plot, because what we have are relatively high values in this first six month period. And then we have decreasing values in the next four or five months, and then it stays low. So we asked our friends in St. Louis what was going on, and it turns out the primary lead smelter was required to put 
new control technology in at the end of December. They had some problems tuning it up, but they had it running smoothly by May, and it's been running well ever since. So we get then a pattern here that goes along with what we know has actually been happening to the source. We can also then look at local sources through something called a conditional probability function, where again, we're gonna look at a conditional probability based on, in this case, wind direction. So how many times during the 24 hour sampling period is the wind blowing from a given delta theta? And then how many of the times when it's blowing from that direction do we have a high concentration? And again, we can then start to focus back on where those sources are likely to be. So if I look at the lead smelter, you see that it very nicely points down at the lead smelter. And if I look at the steel mill, it very nicely points up at the steel mill. So we can point fingers at people and say, you did it. So we wind up then with an apportionment that looks something like this. And you see that much of it is secondary sulfate, part of it is secondary nitrate. The point sources actually don't contribute in general a whole lot. The biggest one is the steel mill the copper and the lead and the zinc plant don't contribute a whole lot of mass, but they contribute a whole lot of non-ferrous metals. And so if we're interested, for example, in lead exposure, then although the lead is only producing 1.3 of the mass on average, it's producing about 80% of the lead. So we can dig out different things depending on what we're interested in. All right, now one of the things we've done over the last few years is to recognize that we can take this framework and we can put in what we know about the system in order to get better resolution, okay? Again, we have a least squares formalism. It's no different, really, than the least squares formalism in CMB, except it actually is more flexible. And so what we can do then is if we know specific profiles, we can incorporate them into the PMF analysis as constraints. We know how to do constrained least squares. And so we have a couple of examples that were published with respect to crustal sources in conjunction with Javier Querol at the University of Barcelona, where we were looking at trying to separate road dust from construction dust and where we were trying to separate road dust from the emissions of the ceramics industry in Castillon, Spain. Castillon produces 17% of the world's ceramic tiles. And then more recently, uh, Fulvio Amato and I, Fulvio and, and uh, Alberto Escrig spent a summer with me in Potsdam where we got this work started, and then Fulvio is a really sharp guy, and so it's fun working with him, so I gave him this problem to work on, where we had some additional data. At the super site, there were some periods in which they had intensive high time resolve data coming from John Andoff and some other people a more limited collection of data uh, in terms of species, but now with high time resolution. And so we could use that then to develop profiles for the four major point sources. And we could then put those and the spark and compression profiles that we took from the literature, again, taking fleet average ones, not taking individual ones. And now we could put this together with all three sites that were available in town, there were two chemical speciation network sites plus the super site. We had previously analyzed each of these individually, but now we could analyze them jointly 
Here's my mandatory, you can't read it slide. Everybody's got to have one of those in a talk. Again, if you're interested in this, just send me an email. I'll be happy to send you the paper or anything else you want. The point is that now, in several cases, we didn't necessarily see all these sources or have them well resolved at each of the sites. And so by putting them together and putting in these six known sources, we're now able to get a more complete analysis of the data and ones where we think we have better results. So in other words, we, have, we can compare now these results with our original results. And you can see that we now have additional sources resolved and we think we have tighter bounds on uh, the uncertainties with regard to them. So I think we wind up with a, a better apportionment, an apportionment which is probably going to be more useful to the folks in the area who are trying to bring uh, these areas into attainment with the ambient air quality standard for particulate matter. So if you're interested in knowing more, there was a special issue of atmospheric pollution research a couple of years ago that Dave Cohen and I put together. Uh, this journal is an open access journal, so anybody can download it. And there's a whole variety of papers, including one that provides some of this historical perspective, as well as a number of papers from uh, a variety of applications. And so, let me summarize then that we've now got receptor models to be an accepted part of the US air quality management system. We have software which is readily downloadable from US EPA site. Um, it is not a plug and chug exercise, and one of the problems is that too many people try and do that. You've got to take the time to know the territory. And so we've been working with the Joint Research Center in ISPRA to help them come up to speed. We've now had a couple of intercomparison exercises run by them. They've developed a unified protocol for the model use. So I think we have some flexible, relatively easy to use models that can help extract maximum information from the data that are available. And I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. So uh, just a reminder that if we have some questions, we ask you to use the microphone, there's one over here, or to put up your hand and I'll hand you a microphone. Phil, like on uh, one of your almost final slides, you showed gasoline and um, diesel as factors. Mm -hmm. Uh, how did they determine gasoline as opposed to uh, Basically diesel? by the relative ratios of OC to EC. Okay, uh, in other words, a highway diesel, run, uh, a modern highway diesel has much more black carbon than or organic carbon. After the tier one diesel rule in 1994, diesels became much drier than they used to be. Um, the problem is, though, that stop and go and slow moving diesels put out about 50 50 OCEC. So, really, the gasoline is still a mixture of, gasoline, of spark ignition vehicles plus the slow moving diesels. Um, even with molecular markers, uh, it's really difficult to separate diesel from, from spark ignition because. What you're doing is primarily trying to use the additional lube oil burning in terms of a signal from calcium and zinc, as well as the additional hopanes and stearanes that you get to try and do the separation. But you know, burning lube oil is burning lube oil. If you have enough cars 
you would be producing something fairly similar. Um, so, you know, again, burning C8 versus burning C16 are not all that different, and the emissions are pretty similar. Thank you. It's the hardest problem we got. Yes. On the other hand, I don't think we want to put the lead back. <laughs> or manganese. <laughs> Sure. Again, again, it depends on the time scale. Yeah. I mean, we've used, you know, we did molecular marker study in Rochester. We've extensively used levoglucosan, for example, to, as a marker for wood smoke. And there's now talk about, you know, well, it reacts in the atmosphere. Well, in the middle of December at minus 10 degrees Celsius, I think it's probably going to be pretty stable, you know. On a boreal forest fire episode that's penetrating into the in, into the United States, then it's had a lot of time to cook, and that's a different thing altogether. So, again, depends on the scale and the time frame of the sampling. I had a quick question. So these are uh, really the, the methods you're using are really what I would call top-down approaches. Uh, and so to measure what's really coming out from emission sources. Uh, and it's really a, a reality check on the uh, emissions yep. inventories, which are a primary tool in air quality management plans. Do you have any examples? I'm sure you do have a few examples where you've actually used these approaches to come up with new discoveries of uh, emissions that we didn't know were there. Oh, yeah. No, there's several yeah. cases where things have popped up that weren't in the emissions inventory or things which are in the emissions inventory. For example, um, our looking at New York City um, showed much lower biomass burning than the emissions inventory suggested. Mm -hmm. uh, there just wasn't enough potassium and, and black carbon there to, to um, go anywhere near close to, to what uh, New York State DEC's emissions inventory was. Whereas in Rochester, um, we hit it right on. So, um, you know, I suspect that, that, you know, moving wood into New York City, they raised the price enough or something like that that people stopped burning it, hmm. or at least for the years that we had data. So it actually changed the inventories, <laughs> yeah. changed the management plans. Because actually wood, wood burning in New York State, in, particularly in upstate New York, is the largest source of primary particles from New York State sources of fine particles. Mm -hmm. I got one question. When you were referring to the chemical transport model, were you referring to a CALPA? Or what models were you referring to? CMAC, CAMAX. Any air quality model, take your choice. I mean, Ted Russell has now developed this, what he calls a, a hybrid approach, where he has the output from CMAC and then uh, PMF, and then puts them together to try and come up with new profiles, which he can then use into a CMB to give him a final result. Taking into account aging or? Yeah, I yeah. mean, again, that's part of what the CMAC is trying to do. Yeah, I have uh, more or less two questions which are connected. One thing is, it seems, and that's known, that you need quite significant sizable data sets uh, and also quite a number of different components, meaning chemical measurements. Uh, is there a chance to use this to come up with a bit more specific molecular or elemental markers in order to simplify this for applications where you don't want or you, for practical reasons, cannot have three, four, mm -hmm. five-year measurements with all the analytical uh, possibilities of a super site or something like that? Yeah. Because that, okay. that with 
connected right? to Remember the applicability. Remember what, this, what this, these systems depend on are what are called edges in the data. Okay, if you make a biplot of two variables you measure, you typically are going to form a triangle of data. Those two bounding lines are actually the source profiles. You don't want to look at a regression. I mean, if you have only one source, then you'll actually get a line. But in most things, you actually have multiple sources, and you, so you fill a space. And it's those two edges where one of the sources are missing defines this one, and where the other source is missing defines that one. So the question is, you know, if I could manipulate the atmosphere, okay, I would only need one more sample than the number of sources to have a data set that would work. But they don't let me do that. <laughs> And the problem is that for many things, having a source that's low enough to be considered missing, you know, when is traffic zero in Toronto? <laughs> okay? So... Probably during the recent ice storm. <laughs> right, there are times when it's low, but the point is that those are not common occurrences, and if you're only sampling every third day, how do you get enough of those points into the data set? That's why you need big data sets. Okay, again, the question is, is how unique are those profiles? I mean, you know, where I've got these nice four point sources where they're putting out wonderfully unique combinations of, of easily measured elements, not hard to do. But, you know, if I'm trying to do gasoline and and, and diesel, I got a problem. So, you know, it's, it's a quite, the other thing is, is that you can help yourself by improving the time resolution, okay? Right now, for example, we don't take advantage of the diurnal pattern of traffic, okay? We average over 24 hours, and that gets rid of a lot of this nice variability which would help us. So as we move to things like the in-the-field X-ray fluorescence system or in-the-field OCEC measurements and other kinds of things where we get you know, hourly data or even better than that, now we can see plumes coming across. Now we can see this kind of diurnal variation. We can look at what happens as the mixing height goes up during the day. And that helps us get a lot better at, at doing this. But the question is, can you, can you get that kind of equipment out in the field? I mean, again, that's one of the things that, for example, the aerosol mass spectrometry people can do. But you got to watch them because they keep putting up filled-in pie charts. Well, they can't fill in the pie charts. They didn't measure black carbon. They didn't measure any refractory inorganics. They're missing. 10 to 20% of the aerosol mass. They get nice stuff. I'm not saying it's not nice stuff, but it's not a filled-in pie chart. Challenge them on that. I do. <laughs> this kind of brings me to my second question. How accurate does a chemical measurement actually have to be, or, is, or to which extent is it sufficient if it's just a reproducible method? Well, when you're going to the patterns, I mean, that's a little bit, um, bit mean about the EPA. They have all the standardized methods. They're not really, from an analytical point of view, always the right. state of well, the art. I mean, again, as, as, as we were saying you know, at, at, at the ministry yesterday, as I was pointing out, the federal reference method for mass is the ideal example of a standard method. That's a way of uniformly arriving at the wrong answer. Uh, yeah, precision is good, but again, if it, depending on what the precision of your components are relative to the precision of the mass that you're trying to apportion, if those are wildly different, then you'll have problems. Any further questions?
So do any of these uh, methods use Bayesian statistics, or do you, you can. feel there it helps? You can. Huh? There are people who have yeah. done that. I mean, we, we've, uh, Unsun Park at, at the Texas A&M University had, had, has done a couple, of, and we work with her on a couple of projects. But again, it's sufficiently complicated that are you getting enough extra information that it's worth that extra work? Uh, coming up with the priors is non-trivial. Thank you. Another question. You've got a microphone right there. I'll let you use that one. Uh, hi, Professor Hopke. Hi. Uh, this quick question for the threshold. In your work, you talk about the PM uh, PM2 port file TSP. I guess it's 24-hour sampling. For one year, you may have a uh, relative, relatively low resolution. And now we have a more continuous measurements for heavy metals. Uh, in, your me in your analysis, you use the media or me as a threshold to look at high concentrations. Mm -hmm. For the continuous measurements, because we have a lot of data, we may be able to use uh, 90 percentile or 99 even. Sure. What's that threshold where it changes the picture for the profiles? Well, again, depends on what you want to look at. I mean, do you want to look at the sources that are contributing on the worst days? Are those the ones you want to focus on first? Do you want to get a more general idea as to what the source, which sources are important? I mean, the, the, the analysis, either CPF or PSCF, are hierarchical. So as you increase the criteria value, those areas will shrink, but they all ought to follow the same basic pattern. And what you'll get as you go, as, if you have enough data that you could go up to high levels, is that you're going to get those um, you know, highest, case days, highest case days, and you know, are they then the ones you want to deal with? I mean, we, we did, uh, we had a, a case where we were sampling in Philadelphia in um, July of 2002 when we had, again, one of the, the boreal forest fire episodes coming down the East Coast. And um, so we have a few hours with, you know, up to 165 micrograms per cubic meter of PM 2.5, largely uh, OC and EC. And you know, again, if we, if we raise the criteria value, we can point right to that area just to the east of James Bay where the fires were. And it's a nice, nice way of demonstrating that the methodology works. But then as I back off of that, then I can see where the BC or the OC is coming from on a, on, on a broader set of, of data over that month of July. So again, it depends on what question you're trying to answer. Another quick question. The example with the Saharan dust. So uh, were they that? Wouldn't that be collinear with uh, sources of crustal material yeah. in, in the United uh, that's States That's why well? it comes out as soil, but you get the peaks. So you know you have that background of relatively low contributions, and then the peaks when the soil's coming over. It's a little different composition in that, you know, uh, the sarin dust tends to be fairly iron rich, that's why it's red dust. Uh, but we can see, for example, we did a series of, of analyses of high mountain improved sites on the west coast. And if you look at the soil profile we, we extract, it corresponds very nicely with some standard reference material Gobi desert dust that the Chinese have had, except it's highly enriched in sulfate because mm -hmm. it came over Beijing and Tianjin. Mm. <laughs> All right, if there's no further questions, uh, let's take this opportunity to thank our speaker. Um, I just have one small uh, presentation to make. We have something for you to take home and oh, thank remember you very the much. occasion. It's a small plaque, so uh, super. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you very much.